Chapter 9, Volcanoes and Other Igneous Activity Volcanic Eruptions. The factors that determine how violent a volcanic eruption is are composition of the magma, temperature of the magma, and dissolved gases in the magma. The viscosity of the magma is a measure of the material's resistance to flow. And those factors that affect the vis viscosity are temperature. The hotter magmas are less viscous, okay, so they're resistant to flow, less liquidy. Okay, composition of silica content. High silica means very viscous, okay, uh, very resistant to flow, like the rhyolitic lavas. Low silica, or more fluid, are your basaltic lavas. Okay. Then dissolved gases, volatiles in that magma, which is mainly water vapor and carbon dioxide. Gases expand near the surface. They're able to easily escape, then the eruption will be less violent. But if they have a hard time escaping, like in a rhyolitic lava, it'll be a more, um, more disastrous eruption. Okay, so they, those dissolved gases provide the force to extrude the lava out of the volcano. And the violence, like I just said, the violence of the eruption is related to how easily the gases escape from the magma. So easy escape from fluid magma, and, there, and from viscous magma, it's more violent because gases can't easily escape. Okay. So lava flows. Basaltic lavas are more fluid. The types of lava flows you will see are pahoehoe lava, which represents braids and ropes, and a ah -ah lava, rough jagged blocks. Okay. Now gases in the lava, 1 to 5% of magma by weight of gases, mostly water vapor and carbon dioxide. So here's, here's a pahoehoe lava flow. And as the surface cools, you get this ropey appearance on the lava. Now, ah ah lava, this is blocky, chunky lava, it moves a lot slower. That's the ah ah lava. Okay. You also have pyroclastic materials. These are materials that, that uh, eject out of the volcano. Now we call it the fire fragments. And types of these materials, we, we, um, we differentiate be between them by size of particle. So you may have very fine glassy fragments, which are ash and dust. You might have chunks of pumice, these rocks full of, of holes that, that are from like a frothy lava, and they're very light in weight, and the pumice can actually float in water. Lapilli is wallet-sized chunks, and cinders are pea-sized chunks. Now, particles larger than lapilli are blocks and bombs. A block is a chunk of hardened lava that gets ejected. A bomb is ejected as hot lava, so it'll actually form a streamlined uh, shape because it'll cool in the air in flight. So here's some samples of the size of volcanic ash and lapilli. So ash may be very small like this. And lapilli, you get bigger chunks like this. And very full of, full of holes okay, from air bubbles, air pockets. This is a volcanic bomb from Hawaii. So it's ejected molten lava that solidified while it's flying through the air. That's why it forms this nice aerodynamic shape. Okay, now features we find on volcanoes. We find conduits or pipes, which is where, which carries the gas-rich magma to the surface. And the vent is a surface opening connected to the magma chamber by a pipe. Then a crater is a steep walled depression at the summit. Now if that crater is greater than one kilometer in diameter, we call it a caldera. Okay. Other features, maybe we may have a parasitic cone on the side of a volcano, or fum fumarole, so little, um, little just plain vents on the, on the side of a volcano. Now there are three major types of volcanoes we're going to talk about. We'll talk about the shield volcano, is a broad, slightly domed volcano, primarily made of basaltic lava, very fluid flowing lava. It's generally very large in size. For example, Mauna Loa in Hawaii is a large shield volcano. So you see it's a very broad, low volcano, very large. This one has a nice summit uh, caldera, very large caldera. Now here's a magma chamber with its pipes or conduits, okay. okay and up here's the picture of, of the volcano. There's another diagram, shallow, there's, shallow, there's a shallow magma chamber, and, and here's a region of partial melting of the summit caldera, okay. Another type is our cinder cone. They're built from ejected lava fragments, very steep slope angle. They're fairly small in size, and they tend to occur in groups. So here's a diagram of a cinder cone. We have our central vent going up from the magma chamber, and it launches out, it ejects chunks, chunks of pyroclastic material that build up this volcano. There's a picture of a cinder cone near Flagstaff, Arizona. 
Now composite cones are stratovolcanoes. Most are adjacent to the Pacific Ocean. For example, Mount Rainier, uh, Mount St. Helens, Mount Hood. Very large in size. They're built of interbedded um, bedding of lavas and pyroclastics. They might be alternating layers of lava and pyroclastics. They're the most violent type of activity. They tend to very uh, violetic uh, lavas. Uh, um, so, so here's a diagram of a uh, stratovolcano or composite volcano. So you see where these interbedded layers of of lava flows and pyroclastic material, so a magma chamber. Uh, we have a crater up here. Uh, we have a parasitic cone that's built up that kind of takes some of the, lo the magma away from the main, from the uh, main eruption. Okay, here's a picture of Mount Fuji in Japan. So it's a very classic looking composite volcano, very large, majestic. So here's a size comparison. So our Hawaiian shield volcano is very large, not necessarily so tall. Our crater, our, our cinder cones are nice and small. They are large uh, composite cone volcanoes. Okay. Those composite cones often, often produce nuae ardents. These are fiery pyroclastic flow. They have hot gases infused with ash. The flow is down the sides of volcanoes, very fast speeds, up to 125 miles per hour. Also may produce a lahar, a volcanic mud flow. So here's an example. We have this pyroclastic material here, pyroclastic flow going down the side. Okay, here, here it comes. Here comes the wave of the pyroclastic flow coming, coming right down the side of that mountain. Here's an example after a lahar flow, after uh, Mount St. Helens erupted. Over here in a circle, this is actually a human being here. So these trees are very tall. And you see this line here. We look, the, the lahar that flowed through was pretty deep. Okay, a lot of material came through here, felled trees. Okay. Our caldera, caldera is right up, um, on the uh, top of the volcano. The summit crater is, if that crater is really large, greater than one kilometer in diameter. We have a caldera. There are steep wall depressions at the summit formed by a collapse. So after the eruption, the large magma chamber empties out, and now it can't support the weight of the mountain rocks above it. So so it tends to collapse in and forms this big caldera. It's nearly circular. Okay. Fissure eruptions and lava plateaus. Fluid basaltic lava extrudes from close crustal fractures called fissures. They call be a plateau. There are many fissures and, and there have been over history many, many um, basaltic lava flows over the surface of the earth there. Uh, here's an example, Crater Lake, Oregon. It's a great example of formation of caldera. We have big Mount Mazama, okay, mountain. A massive eruption emptied out the top of its crater here, I mean, sorry, its magma chamber. So then the top of the mountain collapsed in, forming this really large crater, and it's slowly filled in uh, with rainwater. There's no real good drainage system here. So we have a uh, crater lake. Picture crater lake and Wizard Island. This is a, after, after that eruption that created this, then additional volcanic activity um, created this, this little volcano called, called uh, Wizard Island. Okay. Columbia River salts, there are fissures in, um, in, in the land that cause, that um, erupt uh, basaltic uh, lava flows, and so we have all these Columbia River basalts going over this, this region here. Okay. So the picture of Columbia River Plateau, so we see these, these formations of successive um, lava flows that formed into nice solid rock. Okay. Now we have volcanic pipes and necks. Pipes are those short conduits that connect the magma chamber to the surface. Okay, now if the magma solidifies in the pipe and then the rock around that pipe gets eroded away, you're left behind a volcanic neck like Ship Rock, New Mexico. So it's just the resistant vents left standing after the rest of the volcano is eroded away. So here is Ship Rock, New Mexico. And uh, here's the uh, original volcano cone that's been eroded away. Okay. Now, Mount St. Helens, after the eruption, there was still some more volcanic activity and lava bubbling up here um, formed a nice obsidian dome. Okay, now that was all volcanic igneous activity. Now, we also have igneous activity going on below the surface of the Earth. So, most magma. Is, is underground, okay? And underground igneous bodies that form from this magma are called plutons, okay? These are rocks formed from cooling magma, and we classify them according to their shape, okay? A tabular pluton, 
it's like sheet light, very large but thin. Okay, is um, is one kind, and then massive is a big bulbous bulb of 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 uh, rock. Okay, now if a tabular um, pluton cuts across rock layers, that's called discordant. If if this uh, this tabular pluton cuts between features of sedimentary strata, we call it concordant. Okay, so that tabular discordant uh, pluton that cr cuts across uh, sedimentary layers we call a dike, and the one that's concordant that goes between sedimentary layers we call a sill. Now a lacolith is similar to a sill but kind of like, like has a circular top, kind of like a mushroom cap, and it pushes up above it, the, um, the sedimentary layers above it. So here's the diagram here. So here with these large plutons here, okay, here we have eroded away lacolith that had a mushroom cap shape to it. These sills are these be parallel to the other rock layers, okay? And then these that cut across the sedimentary layers we call dikes. Okay. Here's an example of a sill out here in Arizona. This is an igneous rock here with sedimentary rock above and below it. Okay. Now that lacolith is lensate ma mass again, that mushroom cap, and it arches overlaying strata upwards. The batholith is the largest intrusive body. They often occur in groups. Surface area exposed is 100 plus square kilometers. Okay, smaller bodies we call stocks. Frequently form the cores of mountains. So here are some big batholiths. And as the surface bone get eroded and they get lifted up, they, they form these cores of these, these nice granitic, granitic mountains. Okay, what, uh, where does magma come from? Magma originates when it's sent from solid rock. Located in the crust and the upper mantle starts to melt. What uh, factors influence the generation of magma from solid rock? Well, one, we need heat. Earth's natural temperature increases with depth, which is the geothermal gradient, so which is not sufficient to melt rock at, at the lower and upper mantle. But as you get deeper into the earth, it gets hotter and hotter. Okay, so additional heat is also generated by friction and subduction zones. Uh, crustal rocks are heated during subduction. Rising hot mantle rocks also uh, add to the heat. Now pressure, pressure increases the claim pressure, causes an increase in the melting temperature. So when what's causing the pressure is removed and we have a drop in confining pressure, uh, we have decompression melting because with less pressure, the melting temperature lowers and the rocks are hotter than that, they melt. And when um, this occurs, when, when um, rocks um, are lifted up and overlaying rocks are eroded away. Okay, also volatiles are an important factor primary water, they cause rock to melt to lower temperatures, and they play an important role in subduction ocean plates, because the water from the ocean gets subducted in with that, that crust. Okay, partial melting, igneous rocks are a mixture of minerals. Melting occurs over a range of temperatures, and each mineral has a different melting point. So, this, so as the minerals melt, as the right temperature is reached, you end up with a magma with a higher silica content than the original rock, because the silicas, the quartz and silicates, they will, they will uh, melt at a lower temperature than the very mafic minerals. Okay. So where, what's the, how's the distribution of igneous activity around the, the earth? It's, it's not random. Most volcanoes are located on the margins of the ocean basins, okay, especially the Pacific Ocean, the Ring of Fire. There's a secondary group confined to deep ocean basins, and a third group include those found on the interior of continents. So here, right around this Ring of Fire, we have plenty of Volcanoes along the outer edge of the Pacific um, plate. We'll also have volcanoes along here in the Ocean Ridge. Okay. okay, plate motions provide the mechanism by which mantle rocks melt to form, form magma. So convergent plate boundaries, we have a descending plate partially melts, and magma slowly rises upward. And that rising magma can form volcanic island arcs in the ocean, like the Aleutian Islands, or continental volcanic arcs, like the Andes Mountains or the Cascade Mountains. The Andes Mountains are South America, Cascade Mountains, North America. At divergent plate boundaries, uh, there's a large volume of volcanic rock is produced along the oceanic ridge systems. As the lithosphere pulls apart, there's less pressure on the underlying rocks, so we have partial melting. So large quantities of fluid basaltic magma are produced. Okay. Now within a plate, in the middle of a plate, uh, we may have plumes of hot mantle material may rise from below. And this forms localized volcanic regions called hot spots. So examples of these are the Hawaiian Islands and the Columbia River Plateau in the north, northwestern 